This lecture is going to look at some of the background information on HY8 and also introduce you to some of the terminology we use to describe culverts. First up, I wanted to show you what a completed design in HY8 looks like. You have basically a cross section of a roadway with a culvert poking through it. On the upstream side of the culvert, you'll have a headwater elevation that's computed. Then you'll have a water surface profile inside the culvert that's also computed and usually a tailwater elevation that you provide the program. And those are two, uh, two good points to make that you need to know these terminology. Uh, the headwater is on the upstream side of the culvert, on the inlet side. The tailwater is on the downstream side of the, next to the outlet. And then this trapezoidal berm here you see is, is a roadway. Uh, that's the roadway that you're modeling um, with the culvert through it. NRCS used to have an independent software called Hydraulics Formulas, and it had a tab for culverts, but it was always confusing because it didn't have the right features to model roadway culverts. It was really meant for pressure flow calculations from pond outlet pipes. A few years ago, NRCS discontinued the Hydraulics Formula software and rolled those tools into the Engineering Field Tools software and made several updates. That old culvert tool still exists, but now it's called Pressure Flow has a better drawn sketch, and is labeled not for culvert flow. It's good for you to know that this software exists, but the HY8 is a better tool for roadway culverts. Now this is HDS number five. This is the technical backstop and all the formulas and methodology that are behind the scenes in HY8. So this is a huge document. It's made by uh, you know, the U.S. Department of Transportation, FHWA, and it's available free uh, on the web. It also comes as part of the HY8 install package. So when you go to help in, in HY8, you'll see the, the HY8 help files, and you'll also see some reference documents. This is one of them. So definitely you don't need to read this all the way through, but the next lecture I've set up, uh, I do ask you to look at a few specific sections in H HDS5. I want to talk about what's the difference between a culvert and a bridge. Well, I, you can see both of these drawings kind of look like a bridge. Like this box culvert down here, if a box culvert's big enough, it, it looks quite a lot like a bridge. Well, in general, the cutoff is 20 feet. After 20 feet, it's called a bridge, and you need to have biennial bridge inspections. And that is a big issue. So if you want to avoid those inspections, keep it under 20 feet. Now, in the old days, we would never, in our line of work, we would never design a culvert larger than 20 feet or even 10 feet. But these days, we have much more, a much better understanding of aquatic organism passage and fish, pa fish passage, and we've had lots of recent flooding events. Um, so you're much more likely to design a culvert that is oversized than one that is properly hydraulically sized. So we might oversize a culvert to allow for better fish passage or uh, less debris blockage, uh, rather than going with you know, the bare minimum hydraulic opening. So it's much more likely that you'll run into a, a large culvert, say upwards of 10 feet, in your designs these days. These are some of the shapes that you'll run into of culverts. Uh, yeah, you know, we've all seen circular ones and boxes. Boxes are usually concrete. Pipe arches are a little less common. Um, you'll often see these in large sizes, like six feet or eight feet. And elliptical pipes are used usually for uh, to, for clearances uh, below or above crossing utilities. Um, they'll give you, they'll have like a, a 24 inch equivalent elliptical pipe that'll give you a similar flow rate to a 24 inch circular pipe, but it'll be only you know 19 inches tall, giving you a couple more inches of clearance. Uh, so those are used uh, in urban areas sometimes. And then these are the open bottom shapes. You know, they're all kind of variations on an arch, either with squared off corners or with taller, taller side walls. Um, and these can be all kinds of different materials. Well, metal and concrete, basically. Uh, we don't usually see plastic uh, in, in an open bottom shape. And then this is kind of a combination of those two scenarios. This is a, a round culvert that's been embedded in the stream bottom. So they've, they've put in the round culvert, they've backfilled it, and then they've gone in and put stones inside the culvert. So here there's a low flow channel going all the way through and there's stones up on the sides too. So this kind of, uh, it's kind of counterintuitive, like why would you do this? Uh, why not just have an open bottom culvert? But uh, in extreme storm events, 
you know, very large storms, they might scour out all of this material right down to the bottom of the culvert. And since the bottom of the culvert is down there, buried, that'll provide some great control for the stream. Like the stream won't necessarily undercut underneath that. It, it will probably just hold to that bottom of the culvert. Whereas with an open bottom culvert, there's really no control over over how far down this scours in, in an extreme storm. It might scour down 20 feet. It might expose all the abutments and you know undermine them too. So with a embedded closed culvert, uh, you can uh, kind of avoid that problem. Now we're going to go into a little bit about flow types and flow control. Basically, we have two types of flow control for culvert systems. We have inlet control and outlet control. Inlet control means that the inlet edge of the culvert is controlling the capacity of that culvert. That's that just that front edge of the culvert. Nothing past it, nothing to do with the tailwater, it's just the inlet edge. We basically have two types of inlet control, whether the inlet is submerged or it's unsubmerged. So you see that in this in this table, it's called flow type one and flow type five. These flow types, you do not ha don't have to memorize or anything. They're just referenced in HY8. And once you do a analysis, it'll tell you what flow type you have, and if you're, and you know, interested in what exactly that means, and you can't tell it from the diagram, then you can go back to this chart and figure it out. So flow type one and flow type five are for inlet control. Then these rest of them. Uh, are for outlet control. And outlet, outlet control gets a little more complicated because it covers scenarios where the culvert barrel controls the capacity or where the tailwater elevation controls the capacity. So you'll have the same kind of conditions from before. Is the inlet submerged? Is the outlet submerged? Yes or no. And then it'll, uh, it'll compute whether the outlet is submerged. So no, no, yes, no, no. And then the length full is also a uh, uh, a descriptive factor. Maybe none of the pipe is full, all the pipe is full, most or part. Um, so there's much more variation in the out outlet flow control types. And these are some sort of pictures of the inlet control scenarios. You know, remember we had flow type 1 and flow type 5. And for each flow type, they've just gone in and drawn pictures of either having uh, an outlet submerged or outlet unsubmerged. And so remember on flow type one, the inlet is unsubmerged, and they've given you two scenarios with the outlet submerged and the outlet's not submerged. And so like, if you saw this system in in nature, you would you would probably assume that the tailwater elevation, since it, the tailwater is submerged, you would, you'd assume that the tailwater elevation is controlling the capacity of this. But in actuality, the inlet edge its function under inlet control, the inlet edge is controlling the capacity, even though there's this big pile of standing water here. These are the diagrams for outlet control. You'll see this one up here <laughs> covers type six and seven. Uh, remember six and seven are, are basically the same. One is uh, most full and one is part full. So, you know, there's m not much difference between those two. And then uh, two, three, and four. So those are all the different types of outlet control that, de that are described in that chart. And then this is a final di diagram. These diagrams are all from HDS5, uh, by the way. Um, this one shows flow overtopping a roadway, which is what we generally want to avoid, except uh, our designs are usually for smaller design storms and we'll usually just check for the 100 year storm or the 500 year storm and that will often overtop the road. One thing I wanted to note in this diagram is that the, the roadway up here is simplified as a flat uh, broad crested weir. So that means there's no crown. H HY8 does not consider this to have a crown even though most roads are crowned. So when you're setting up your your model uh, you you should just use the the center line elevation of the road as a uh, as a flat cross section, even though that's not what's actually out there. Uh, as it turns out, this is a fairly safe assumption that uh, a roadway with a gentle crown does act pretty much like a flat broad crested weir. Um, so it is a simplification in the model, um, but it works pretty well. Now, why would the inlet edge of a culvert 
control the capacity of the culvert? Why wouldn't just the, the barrel condition uh, do it? And this diagram kind of shows why. At a sharp edged inlet, the flow contracts. This is kind of counterintuitive. Why doesn't the water just flow to fill up all the space it's given? Well, as water moves through a sharp edge inlet, it contracts. That's kind of one of these quirks of fluid dynamics that, that you might not realize. If you have a smooth edged inlet, it will contract less. So you see over on this side, the smooth edge shows a minimum flow contraction. With the sharp edge, you got a, a fairly large contraction. So that contraction of flow limits the capacity of that inlet edge of the pipe. So you can see, you know, just downstream of that inlet, the pipe is flowing full. Um, it has greater capacity. So when we're operating an inlet control, that's just saying the inlet edge of the pipe is controlling how much water can go through there due to this contraction of flow. These are some pictures of inlet conditions that, that we see regularly. Uh, up here is the thin edge projecting. This is just, you got a metal cover, you put it in the ground, you backfill it, and leave it. Okay, a mitered entrance. We see this sometimes out here, almost never with this elaborate concrete apron part. A square edge and head wall, you see this sometimes. This is a, this happens to be a concrete pipe, but you might have plastic or steel um, edged in the head wall. And then this, this is here for um, for reference, this is a, a grooved edge projecting. You'll see options for grooved edges in H, HY8. Uh, if you have a concrete pipe, each section has a grooved end, which is the bell end, and the other end is the spigot. And they fit together and they lock together. So when you're putting in concrete pipe, you always want to have the grooved end pointing upstream because that has a better hydraulic opening than the, than the square end. Now, HDS5 does have summaries of a few extra topics. We get fish passage, inlet outlet scour, broken back culverts, and storage routing. Uh, these are all summaries of uh, larger documents that the federal government has put together on these topics. So we're gonna have a short le lecture on fish passage. The others I'm not gonna cover, but you can certainly check out those sections in HDS5 and refer to their uh, respective uh, documents. Um, they're definitely definitely worth covering. Uh, broken back culverts we don't really see too often out here um, but inlet outlet scour is definitely important and storage routing is, is important too. So now I just want to uh, show you how to get to HY8 uh, and start downloading it. Just go to a browser and type in FHWA HY8 and it should come up as one of the top couple links. Now, there's two versions available right now. There's 7.3 beta and 7.2. So for these tutorials, we're gonna be using the 7.3 beta version, but I have had some problems with it on my system, crashing or locking up. Also, the help files aren't really totally, totally there. If you click on help, you just get a giant PDF of everything in it. So if you have trouble with H HY8 version 7.3, switch to 7.2 and you'll be able to follow along with the lessons fairly well. Some of the the inputs are a little different, but it's it's fairly similar. Uh, but use 7.3 definitely if your system supports it. Um, so go ahead and download this and install it. Just follow all the system prompts and uh, and use the default installation locations. All right, that's it. Uh, go ahead and check out HDS5, read those sections that I've covered, and then I'll see you back here for a quick lecture on fist passage. This is a quick look at aquatic organism passage in culverts. Now most people use the term fish passage interchangeably with aquatic organism passage because it's easier to say. Also fish are the most studied animals in terms of aquatic organism passage, um, primarily because they're so valuable for recreational purposes. We're really interested in all the animals that use a river eco ecosystem. They all need to move up and down the river uh, to survive, so we're talking about salamanders and turtles and fish and even macroinvertebrates, uh, the prey that they feed on. 
Now you certainly don't have to consider fish passage for every culvert that you're going to design. Most of our designs are in field, they're more like drainage conveyance. So if a drainage ditch or a swale, you know, it's only wet while it's raining, it's probably not a good uh, fish uh, habitat and you won't have to worry about this. But if you start working on crossings that uh, maybe cross blue line streams or even larger streams, say for a local road, maybe you're doing preliminary engineering for a municipality, uh, fish passage is something you should really consider um, if there's enough water to sustain them uh, in the stream. Now, there's lots of guides about fish passage. Uh, these are two of my favorites. Uh, Vermont Stream Crossing Handbook is really accessible. It's short. There's lots of great pictures. It's a great intro to the topic. And then this other one, Heck Hydraulic Engineering Circular Number 26, Heck 26, uh, is full of technical details about fish anatomy and abilities and modeling stream bottom conditions. Um, it's a really good technical background, much longer and much more uh, much more technically focused. So both of those are good options. Also, the New York State DEC uh, website has a page dedicated to stream crossings and how uh, fish habitat interacts interacts with that. I'll have a link to that in the comments for this video. Now, in order to get a grip on fish passage, we need to understand why would fish need to go upstream in a river. Uh, it's pretty obvious if you put a culvert in, even if it's poorly designed, a fish will probably be able to go downstream through that culvert, as long as the water depth is sufficient. You need to have a certain water depth for fish um, mobility and for it to be able to breathe. So uh, as long as there's enough water, you know, you can probably get a fish downstream through a culvert. Well, the first reason is spawning. Several fish species uh, have this instinct to go upstream to spawn. Uh, you know, Pacific salmon are the classic case, but um, in New York we have salmon and we have trout and uh, several trout species need to go upstream to spawn. Um, so they need to be able to travel up through the culverts that we put in streams uh, in order to do that. Now escape from a stream events, that means floods and droughts. Um, when a flood or a drought hits a stream, fish will tend to move and they can go upstream to escape from those events. Genetic diversity is important because when populations get cut off from each other, there's fewer opportunities for, um, for different breeding pairs. Uh, the, the genes of each subpopulation will become uh, less diverse and that makes them susceptible to, uh, to disease and environmental factors. Uh, cold water habitats and upstream trips, you know, you might have enough water during the hot summer months in your stream, but uh, the water is too hot. So um, many stream will, many fish will seek out those cold water regions, either cold deep pools in the main tributary, or uh, or they'll go upstream into uh, into tributaries that are more shaded, uh, and that'll have that those will have cooler water. And then access to feeding areas, uh, obviously, fish populations will survive if they have more options for feeding areas. If they can go upstream uh, and downstream, they'll have better access to to the food they need. So here's an example of a well-designed crossing. Okay, uh, this is right out of the Vermont Stream Crossing Handbook. It's a great example. There's a large size for handling flood flows. Um, the open arch design means that you will have a natural channel bottom. bottom. Okay, you can see crossing through here, the, the channel bottom is pretty much uniform all the way through the culvert. Uh, it looks just like it does on either end. Okay, it does not constrict the stream channel bank full width, um, natural substrates, and the water depth and velocities match the stream conditions. This is related to not constricting the channel width. Um, if you don't constrict the channel, then the water velocities and depths inside the culvert have a much better chance of being um, similar to the, the natural stream channel outside the culvert. And this is an example of a poorly designed culvert, at least poorly designed in terms of fish passage, the culvert is perched, and in order for a fish to jump up into a perch culvert, which they can do, uh, but there needs to be a uh, suitable pool below the perched culvert, okay, because the fish needs to go down to the bottom, swim up, gain some momentum to jump into the culvert. Uh, in this case, 
the perch culvert is dumping right out onto rocks, and the rocks are actually above the water surface, so there's no way a fish can jump up through the, into this. Obviously, it doesn't have a natural channel bottom. The width of the culvert is also uh, far less than the stream stream width, so there's, there's multiple deficiencies with this culvert. Uh, definitely, if you have more interest in this topic, check out the two uh, resources that I've mentioned and uh, the New York State DEC website. Um, I've posted the DEC website link in the comments and uh, uh, the two documents, the Vermont Stream Crossing Handbook and HEC 26, are listed as uh, subsequent lectures to this one. Uh, don't feel like you have to read the whole thing. Just skim through each one. Uh, maybe just check out the table of contents in HEC 26 to, to see what's in there. Now this is a look through the HY8 interface and I'll be discussing some of the inputs that you need uh, in order to run a simulation. Uh, first when you start up the program you get this option to create a new project or open an existing file. We'll be doing create a new project. And now if you click this box use map feature to locate culvert crossings uh, you'll get a, a Bing map that pops up and that just lets you uh, select kind of the approximate latitude longitude of your culvert crossing. You, know, you can add the aerial photos um, or, or whatever you need to um, uh, to locate your culvert. This doesn't really have any effect on the simulation. It's just more of a you know to help keep things uh, straight in your mind. It'll keep this uh, this image or this lat longitude for the next person that opens your file. Okay, so click OK on that. That brings up kind of the main dialog box. You can have multiple crossings in your project and each crossing can have multiple culverts. So say you were wanted to model you know, two culverts right next to each other, one's 24 inch, one's a uh, 60 inch. Uh, you would put those two culverts in uh, this culvert properties box and do all the properties for each one. Then when it ran the, the simulation, it would pump all your flows through those two culverts. So the crossing properties, uh, I'll go through those first. The first section is discharge data. Uh, discharge method can be minimum design and maximum. Those are more aquatic organism passage terms. We'll typically pick recurrence because that's the way our flows come out of EFH2. Uh, when you come out of EFH2, you'll have one year, two year, five year, ten year, uh, these types of flow recurrence intervals. So you'll put those in here and then click OK. For tailwater data, uh, this section describes what the channel or reach looks like directly downstream of your culvert. Okay, so sometimes you might be outletting into a pond or a lake or something with constant tailwater elevation. If that's the case, you'll select this drop down and do enter constant tailwater elevation. Then you put in your invert and your tailwater. Other times you'll be outletting into a dry channel uh, where you can select trapezoid or rectangular, triangular, whatever shape you'd like. Enter the bottom width, the channel slope, uh, you'll have to do side slopes if it's a trapezoidal or a V-channel. And then uh, the channel slope. And then Manning's N, that's kind of a measure of the roughness of the culvert, of the channel. Uh, you know, it'll, it'll seem rougher if it's dense grass versus if it's smooth concrete. And you can get Manning's N out of pretty much any hydraulics uh, manual. Uh, the one that we have uh, available to us is uh, NEH Section 5. And that's the, the National Engineering Handbook from NRCS. And if you go to there, it, it has this table and you know has pipes, lined channels. And we're not going to see those too much, but uh, this is the section you, you need: the, the vegetated small channels and unlined earth channels. And then uh, occasionally you'll see a, a natural natural stream or something. So uh, you know those those Manning's n values are appropriate for natural streams. Okay, and that's again from uh, NEH Section 5. Uh, it's a pretty old print, but these things don't change that often. All right, so back to HY8. Uh, channel Invert Elevation, that's just the invert at the, uh, the outlet of your culvert. And once you put in all that inf info, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the invert elevation is the invert of the channel, so your culvert might drop into the channel or it might be submerged below the channel, but it's definitely the invert of the channel, not the culvert. And once you get all that info, you can do a rating curve uh, and view that. That's pretty interesting. And next is the roadway data. 
This is just the shape of the roadway above the culvert in case of overtopping. It doesn't really matter if your water doesn't overtop the roadway, then this information is pretty much garbage. But once the roadway, once the roadway is overtopped, then this information is used to model how the water flows over the roadway. Uh, so you can enter a constant roadway elevation or irregular. I usually do irregular. Um, if you have profile data for the roadway or the animal trail or the walkway or whatever you know, road you're modeling, you can enter it as a irregular data. The first roadway station, if you have stationing along the roadway, this is the spot where it's going to start your little, uh, little pictures that HY8 generates. If you don't have stationing, just leave it at zero. Crest length, this is because the roadway overtopping is going to be modeled as a broad crested weir. So the crest length is the length along the roadway stationing. Uh, actually the width if you're standing in the water. If you're standing in the water looking downstream, it'll be the width. Uh, but it's really the, the length along the stationing of the road. That's uh, what it's looking for. Obviously, you're not going to know what the crest length is until you run the simulation. So it's kind of an iterative. You would guess the crest length, maybe you know, 10 feet, run the model, see what it came out with, change the crest length, run it again, see if it matched. Uh, you know, it would be iterative. Usually we're not going to be looking at a detailed design of the roadway overtopping. We just need to know, yes, does it overtop? No, it doesn't overtop you know, for specific design storms. Crest elevation, I uh, remember we talked about the broad crested weir. We're looking at uh, the roadway just as a constant slope across, no crown. So just use the center line or the highest point in the roadway. Uh, use that as the crest elevation. Finally, the ro roadway surface, uh, you know, we'll typically have gravel roads. And the top width is the width, you know, shoulder to shoulder of the roadway. All right, next we'll look at the culvert data, culvert properties. So you can name each one. Uh, that's a good idea to keep things straight shape, right? You got circular, concrete box, all these, all these different options. And there's different materials for each one of these options. Um, you know, so like you don't get, um, you don't get all, all kinds of materials for each one. So as you pick different shapes, these other uh, inputs will change depending on what's needed for that shape. Okay, material, that's pretty self-explanatory. You get all those options. Okay, diameter, embedment depth. Okay, remember diameters and feet, embedment depths and in inches. Uh, a lot of our culverts these days are gonna be embedded to try and uh, form a natural stream bottom through the, the culvert. Manning's N, you can get that from that uh, same, same channel, um, the same manual, hydraulics. Uh, uh, section four or section five. The culvert type, uh, typically we're going to do straight. Okay. Um, there are all these other options, but for the most part, we're going to be doing straight culverts. If you want more description of these other things, you can uh, look in the help file. And then the inlet configuration. Remember we talked about this a little bit uh, a few a few lectures ago. Uh, this kind of describes the shape of the entrance to the culvert uh, and you have all these options okay so and some of these will change with uh, the material and you got um, square edge with head wall grooved edge groove end groove end and head wall all that stuff okay and then inlet depression uh, this is if the inlet invert is depressed um, inside the the channel uh, this is different from being embedded it's when the inlet is actually you know down down lower it's like flows into kind of like a bowl shape and this doesn't uh, we don't usually do this all right and next is the site data for the culvert crossing so this is trying to locate the culvert within your little model um, and you want to do um, culvert invert data okay Embankment tow data is a little uh, a little more confusing, so let's stick with culvert inv invert data for now. Uh, the inlet station would be the station along the river where the inlet is. So if you don't have stationing along your river, just use zero for this. Okay, invert elevation. Obviously, obviously that's the the invert elevation. Outlet station. Okay, if you're starting at zero, then your outlet station is just going to be the length of the culvert. All right, and then outlet elevation, that's the invert at the outlet. 
and then number of barrels, okay, usually going to be just one, but you might have more than one. Okay, so these are the basic uh, inputs that you need for the dialog box. Once you get everything put in, you'll do analyze crossing, and it'll create all the little diagrams and rating tables and flowcharts and all that great stuff. So now that you've finished this, go ahead and do the next little quiz. It's kind of a hide-and-seek quiz to find different features in HY8, and it will prove that you have actually installed it and, uh, and can open it up. So go ahead and check that out, and then the next lecture is going to be um, just going through, walking through a simple example culvert check um, to see, uh, you know, what kind of flow rates and, and things we can manage. Okay, thanks. Now this is a look through the HY8 interface, and I'll be discussing some of the inputs that you need uh, in order to run a simulation. Uh, first, when you start up the program, you get this option to create a new project or open an existing file. We'll be doing create a new project. And now if you click this box, use map feature to locate culvert crossings, uh, you'll get a, uh, a Bing map that pops up. And that just lets you uh, select kind of the approximate latitude longitude of your culvert crossing. You, know, you can add the aerial photos um, or, or whatever you need to um, uh, to locate your culvert. This doesn't really have any effect on the simulation. It's just more of a, you know, to help keep things uh, straight in your mind. It'll keep this, uh, this image or this lat longitude for the next person that opens your file. Okay, so click OK on that. That brings up kind of the main dialog box. You can have multiple crossings in your project and each crossing can have multiple culverts. So say you were wanted to model you know, two culverts right next to each other, one's 24 inch, one's a uh, 60 inch. Uh, you would put those two culverts in uh, this culvert properties box and do all the properties for each one. Then when it ran the, the simulation, it would pump all your flows through those two culverts. So the crossing properties, uh, I'll go through those first. The first section is discharge data. Uh, discharge method can be minimum design and maximum. Those are more aquatic organism passage terms. We'll typically pick recurrence because that's the way our flows come out of EFH2. Uh, when you come out of EFH2, you'll have one year, two year, five year, ten year, uh, these types of flow recurrence intervals. So you'll put those in here and then click OK. For tailwater data, uh, this section describes what the channel or reach looks like directly downstream of your culvert. Okay, so sometimes you might be outletting into a pond or a lake or something with constant tailwater elevation. If that's the case, you'll select this drop down and do enter constant tailwater elevation. Then you put in your invert and your tailwater. Other times you'll be outletting into a dry channel uh, where you can select trapezoid or rectangular, triangular, whatever shape you'd like. Enter the bottom width, the channel slope, uh, you'll have to do side slopes if it's a trapezoidal or a V-channel. And then uh, the channel slope. And then Manning's N, that's kind of a measure of the roughness of the culvert, of the channel. Uh, you know, it'll, it'll seem rougher if it's dense grass versus if it's smooth concrete. And you can get Manning's N out of pretty much any hydraulics uh, manual. Uh, the one that we have uh, available to us is uh, NEH Section 5. And that's the, the National Engineering Handbook from NRCS. And if you go to there, it, it has this table and, you know, has pipes, lined channels. Uh, we're not going to see those too much, but uh, this is the section you, you need. The, the vegetated small channels and unlined earth channels. And then uh, occasionally you'll see a, a natural, natural stream or something. So, uh, you know, those, those Manning's N values are appropriate for natural streams. Okay, and that's again from uh, NEH Section 5. Uh, it's a pretty old print, but these things don't change that often. All right, so back to HY8. Uh, channel Invert Elevation, that's just the invert at the, uh, the outlet of your culvert. And once you put in all that inf info, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the invert elevation is the invert of the channel, so your culvert might drop into the channel or it might be submerged below the channel, but it's definitely the invert of the channel, not the culvert. And once you get all that info, you can do a rating curve uh, and view that. That's pretty interesting. And next is the roadway data. 
This is just the shape of the roadway above the culvert in case of overtopping. It doesn't really matter if your water doesn't overtop the roadway, then this information is pretty much garbage. But once the roadway, once the roadway is overtopped, then this information is used to model how the water flows over the roadway. Uh, so you can enter a constant roadway elevation or irregular. I usually do irregular. Um, if you have profile data for the roadway or the animal trail or the walkway or whatever you know, road you're modeling, you can enter it as a irregular data. The first roadway station, if you have stationing along the roadway, this is the spot where it's going to start your little, uh, little pictures that HY8 generates. If you don't have stationing, just leave it at zero. Crest length, this is because the roadway overtopping is going to be modeled as a broad crested weir. So the crest length is the length along the roadway stationing. Uh, actually the width if you're standing in the water. If you're standing in the water looking downstream, it'll be the width. Uh, but it's really the, the length along the stationing of the road. For a design with a constant roadway elevation, really the crest length would be infinite since there's no side slopes to contain it. For HY8 modeling, the convention is to use the stream width for the crest length. And that's what I'll be doing in this video and the practice problems. Crest elevation, I remember we talked about the broad crested weir. We're looking at uh, the roadway just as a constant slope across, no crown. So just use the center line or the highest point in the roadway. Uh, use that as the crest elevation. Finally, the ro roadway surface, uh, you know, we'll typically have gravel roads. And the top width is the width, you know, shoulder to shoulder of the roadway. All right, next we'll look at the culvert data, culvert properties. So you can name each one. Uh, that's a good idea to keep things straight shape, right? You got circular, concrete box, all these, all these different options. And there's different materials for each one of these options. Um, you know, so like you don't get, um, you don't get all, all kinds of materials for each one. So as you pick different shapes, these other uh, inputs will change depending on what's needed for that shape. Okay, material, that's pretty self-explanatory. You get all those options. Okay, diameter, embedment depth. Okay, remember diameters and feet, embedment depths and in inches. Uh, a lot of our culverts these days are gonna be embedded to try and uh, form a natural stream bottom through the, the culvert. Manning's N, you can get that from that uh, same same channel, um, the same manual, hydraulics, uh, uh, section four, or section five. The culvert type, uh, typically we're gonna do straight, okay? Um, there are all these other options, but for the most part, we're gonna be doing straight culverts. If you want more description of these other things, you can uh, look in the help file. And then the inlet configuration, remember we talked about this a little bit uh, a, few, a few lectures ago. Uh, this kind of describes the shape of the entrance to the culvert. Uh, and you have all these options, okay? So, and some of these will change with uh, the material. And you got um, square edge with head wall, grooved edge, groove end, groove end, and head wall, all that stuff. Okay, and then inlet depression. Uh, this is if the inlet invert is depressed uh, inside the, the channel. Uh, this is different from being embedded. It's when the inlet is actually, you know, down, down lower. It's like flows into kind of like a bowl shape. And this doesn't, uh, we don't usually do this. All right, and next is the site data for the culvert crossing. So this is trying to locate the culvert within your little model. Um, and you wanna do um, culvert invert data, okay? Embankment toe data is a little uh, a little more confusing, so let's stick with culvert inv invert data for now. Uh, the inlet station would be the station along the river where the inlet is. So if you don't have stationing along your river, just use zero for this. Okay, invert elevation. Obviously, obviously that's the the invert elevation. Outlet station. Okay, if you're starting at zero, then your outlet station is just going to be the length of the culvert. All right, and then outlet elevation, that's the invert at the outlet. And then number of barrels, okay. Usually gonna be just one, but you might have more than one. Okay, so these are the basic uh, inputs that you need for the dialog box. 
Once you get everything put in, you'll do Analyze Crossing, and it'll create all the little diagrams and rating tables and flowcharts and all that great stuff. Now we're going to look at inputting actual culvert data into HY8, and we're going to do that using uh, this example problem, which is um, testing the design storms for an existing culvert. So if you had survey on an existing culvert and you put it in, into HY8, you could run through the design storm, see which storm it'll pass and which ones go over the top of the road. Um, now you should go ahead and print out this uh, PDF because when I'm in HY8, it's going to ban me from clicking outside the dialog boxes sometimes. So I won't be able to come back to this PDF quite as often as I would like um, to show you where exactly I'm getting the information from. Um, but to that end, let me just run through the PDF and show you some of the key components. Uh, the first is this peak flows box. You know, these discharge amounts and recurrence intervals are going to be needed for HY8 to know how much flow to route through the system. And this text block gives a little information about the culvert. Uh, the end conditions are thin edge projecting. Remember, the end condition controls how much water can get into the invert and the inlet in end of the culvert. Okay, the material is corrugated steel. That's important. The slope is 2%, the length is 31 feet. A station, that means a station along the roadway, so it's at 0 plus 46.4. That's going to be necessary for HYA to draw that front view diagram. It needs to know where to put the culvert on uh, on your roadway profile. All right, and then the plan view has additional information. Uh, the channel and pipe inverts are listed at each end. Uh, the channel dimensions are kind of listed. It's It says it's 6 feet wide grass lined, one and three side slopes with a 2% slope. That's all information that we'll need to give HY8 so it can compute a tailwater elevation to tell, uh, so it knows how much water's in the channel at the outlet. Okay, then the roadway is 14 feet, the stationing is given. And the only elevation for the roadway is 113.5 at center line. So in this case, we have to assume that the roadway is just a flat uh, 113.5 all the way across. Okay, in other conditions, we might have more profile data that would show um, you know, where the uh, where the sags or crests are in the road. But in this case, we don't. All right, so let's jump back to HY8 and see what's going on there. Uh, since it's not a real project, we're not going to use the map to locate the culvert. Uh, so leave that unchecked. Go ahead and continue. And it pops up with the main dialog box. So let's enter the crossing properties first. Uh, for this, we're just going to call it Lecture 6 or 7. Uh, discharge method, it's going to be recurrence. And then we have to click to define that. And then in this dialog, just type in the flows that you were, uh, that you're given on the PDF. Uh, for the one year, it's 7, 10, 15, 21, 29, and 38 for the 50. We don't have 100, 200, or 500. Let's just click OK on that. And that finishes that section. The tailwater ta data, uh, remember it's a flat bottom channel, so with side slopes, that means it's a trapezoidal channel. Bottom width is 6 feet. Side slope, here you enter the horizontal component of the ratio first, and actually that's all you enter. So if it's 3 to 1, you enter a 3. If it's 10 to 1, you enter a 10. All right. In this case, it's 3 horizontal to 1 vertical, so we'll type that in here, 3. The channel slope, that was given as 2%, but they want it in feet per feet, so it's 0 0.02. Manning's end for the channel, since it's a grass line channel, I'm actually going to use a different reference than the one I showed before. Before we looked at NEH part 650, the hydraulic section. Uh, in this case, since it's grass, I want to use the Vermont Stormwater Management Manual. They have a great little diagram, which is actually sourced from somewhere else, completely different. But uh, Vermont Manual is the easiest place to get it. I'll show that to you. It's for grass line channels and it shows how Manning's end varies with differing flow depths. So you can imagine this as, as water is flowing through a grass channel. If the flow of the water is very shallow, uh, like lower than the tips of the grass blades, that channel is going to feel very rough as the, to, to the water going through it. Whereas as the water gets deeper and deeper, it's going to tend to just kind of flatten that grass against the channel walls and blow right past it. So basically the 
grass channel is going to appear rougher at low flow depths than at, at high flow depths. And that's kind of illustrated in this channel. It's from the Vermont Stormwater Management Manual, uh, Appendix D7, uh, Figure D14. You can look that up online. Uh, this is actually from Part 2 of the manual. It's split into two sections uh, these days. Um, so the Mending's end value here is given as 0.15 for depths up to 4 inches. And then it tails off for deeper depths. So this is going to be kind of an iterative process, figuring out what depth, what the depth of the water in our channel is. We, we don't know that yet. Um, so we're going to type in 0.15 first to give it a start. See what HY8 gives us as the depth at our design storm, and then come back and, and fix it. So here's our Manning's end for the channel. We're going to put in 0.15. Uh, the channel invert elevation, remember this is the tailwater section, so we're looking at the outlet invert elevation which was uh, channel pipe invert 108.88. So let's type that in, uh, into H, H by 8. 108.88. All right, now to, if, to iron out this Manning's end thing, we're going to see the ratings curve. Look at our design storm, 10 CFS for the two year. It says the depth of water is 0.98 feet. That's almost one foot. And if you look back at the chart, in uh, the Vermont Stormwater Management Manual, uh, for one foot, the Manning's end value should be 0.03. Okay, so our 0.15 is not an accurate um, end value for that type of flow rate. So let's go back and, and change it to something, you know, something in the middle middle range. Maybe a 0.08. That that would be a good good one to try. Okay, I'll type it in here 0.08. Okay, and then view the ratings curve again. So now at our design storm, it says our depth is 0 0.7, uh, 0 0.7 feet. I can't do that in my head. 0 0.7 is you know, between eight and nine. It's 8.4 inches. So let's go back and see if 0.7 depth, um, if, if 8.4 inches is close to uh, the end value that we're using, 0.08. So 8 inches here, 0.08 was the reading, so it really should be 0.09 probably. Uh, if we go that far, it's going to skew our results, so let's try 0.085 uh, just for kicks. View the rating curve again, okay. Uh, 10 CFS, depth is 0 0.727, 0 0.727 times 12 is 8.7 inches. Go back to the chart again. You know, 8.7 inches is, is in here now somewhere. So it's basically going to be a value between 0 0.08 and 0 0.085. Uh, for this type of analysis, you can use either one. As long as you're using you know somewhere around 0 0.08 um, for your end value that's going to be uh, valid for that two-year storm. As you can see, if you're looking at other design storms, you see the depth is you know 1.4 at the 50-year storm. So if you you know if you're interested in a particular design storm, you should use a different depth, consequently a different Manning's end value for the tailwater. Uh, you know whichever depth you're looking for, go back to the chart, pick a different depth, and uh, and select that. All right, enough of that. Go back here, uh, roadway data, profiles, constant roadway elevation. Okay, for stationing, uh, let's just use the whole section. It's going to go from 0 to 80. And then for the crest length, we're going to follow the convention I mentioned earlier for constant roadway elevation profiles. We'll simply use the stream width of 6 feet. That will give us a reasonable approximation of how water flows over the roadway, since we're not doing a detailed design of that portion of the flow. We're not really interested in how the roadway functions as a weir. We're just looking at whether the design storm fits through the bottom. Okay, if you're doing uh, a more detailed analysis about how the roadway overtops, this would be really important. In this case, we're not really going to pay attention to, you know, to what um, roadway overtopping uh, values it gives us. Crest elevation was given, 113.5. The roadway surfaced, uh, that wasn't given, but our roads are mostly gravel. Uh, we rarely do paved roads in agriculture. So top width is 14. Uh, that's just the width of the roadway um, as it functions as a weir. 
Okay, then here we got the culvert data. Let's give it a new name. Lecture 7. Okay, the shape we're given is circular and it's steel, uh, corrugated steel. Diameter is 12 inches, but they want it in feet, so we'll give it to one foot. Embedment depth, you know, this will be important if you're doing something for aquatic or organism passage. In this case, um, this is just a dry grass channel. Uh, it's just zero. Mannings N is given for you for that culvert type. It's a straight culvert. There's some different options here. Uh, the inlet configuration is thin edge projecting. Okay. And is not depressed uh, at the inlet. And then the site data, this is important if you were um, given stream stationing. Uh, that stream stationing would go here. In this case, we don't have stream stationing. We're just going to use zero and 31 feet for uh, for these stations. So the inlet station is zero. Inlet elevation is 109.5. Outlet station, just use the length of the culvert, which is 31. Outlet elevation, it's actually the same as the channel inward elevation, 108.88, because it's not embedded at all. And then number of barrels, if you wanted to do multiple barrels, you could. We just have one in this case. So once you have all your culvert data and all your crossing data, go ahead and hit Analyze, and we'll look at the results. This is kind of the basic chart, um, and it'll give you a pretty good idea of what's going on. You can see at the one-year uh, discharge, 7 CFS, 5.31 of that is going through the culvert. Obviously, there's more than 5.31 in the system, though. The remaining 1.64 is going over the roadway. So you can see, in this case, at the one-year design storm, this culvert doesn't handle the flow. Uh, you have some roadway discharge, even at the one-year. So obviously, at the two-year, there's roadway discharge. So in this case, we can say that uh, the culvert does not pass the two-year design storm without, without overtopping. So from here, you would want to you know, come up with a different design if, say if you were rehabbing this road, you would come up with a different design, uh, probably using a larger pipe, because this is a pretty big pretty big difference, 1.64 compared to 5.31. You're not going to make that up by, or sorry, 4.57 to 5.34. You're not going to make that up by making a smoother culvert or even putting in two twelves. No, you're going to need a, a larger culvert to pass this kind of flow. So some of the other analysis uh, results that you can look through, um, there's a culvert summary table. Um, so if you had multiple culverts, this would be useful. You could pick which culvert you wanted to look at. Then the water surface profiles, that's also interesting to look at. At this uh, this dialog box, you can see water surface profiles for all of your culverts. Uh, in the main window, you can only see the profile for the largest design storm. Um, so in this case, um, you can see the two-year design storm right here, selected water surface profile uh, to plot, um, and it'll give you that. Okay, so this is the, the design storm we're looking at, two years. You can see the water on the upstream side is up above the road, and the culvert is almost full all the way all the way to the end, and then the tailwater is down at this elevation. So that's an important chart if you want to print that for your, your analysis. See, if you go um, and close this, first of all, you can't even see it because your, your culvert stationing isn't entered. So you can right-click, define roadway culvert stations. That was given in that text block up at the top um, at 0 plus 46.4, uh, station 0 plus 46.4. So we can go back to, uh, to here and uh, put in the station for that culvert. It's 46.4. Okay, so that shows this culvert on our, you know, our stationing line with our, our culvert stuff. And then if you want to see the cross-section view, which is definitely more interesting, usually you can click this button, side view, but sometimes it doesn't work. So if you click on this over here for the culvert, um, it'll usually go back to that because that's kind of the default view. Um, and then you can go back and forth, but I'm not sure why that's set up like that. Um, anyways, if you find you can't click on this button, try clicking on the culvert in the the work tree and uh, and I'll go back to it. So here you can only see the 38 CFS, that was the 50 year design storm. Uh, so that's definitely, you know, if you want to see the two year, you got to go back to analyze and um, and get to that that window. Water surf profile, select two years, and there you go. All right, so 
the next thing I want you to do, uh, now that you've got kind of a handle on this, the next lecture has a, another problem. Uh, it's very similar to this one. I've just changed the numbers and I've added some profile data so you can't do the constant roadway elevation. You're going to have to add in uh, profile data. And also we're going to give it a, a double barrel culvert uh, to analyze as well. So it's the exact same thing, just different numbers and a little bit different condition. Go ahead and uh, create an HY8 project and enter in this culvert data uh, to see if uh, if the culver can handle the design storm, it's going to be the same thing, two-year design storm. Um, so go ahead and create a project and and run that. Okay, I've attached the HY8 uh, project file that's completed. So don't look at that until after you've done your analysis. Um, but once you get that, uh, you can look at that that completed file to check your results. Okay, and I'll have a, a PDF of the the expected results um, attach as well after that. Obviously don't look at the results files until you actually run the analysis otherwise you won't learn anything but but certainly do look at those to uh, to check to check your work. All right thanks good luck. I'm going to walk you through some of the quirks of HY8 you might have noticed as you're going through the design examples. Uh, first looking at this one the one with the two uh, 12 inch culverts. If you open up your HY8 analysis um, and run it, of course, you'll notice that the roadway dis does discharge over the top at the 10-year storm. It should have 2.5 2 uh, CFS over the road at 10-year and then 25-year it should have uh, even more over the roadway. But when you go to look at the drawing that it gives you, there's no water going over the top. And that's because the uppermost roadway elevation that we've given HY8 is actually above the water surface elevation. So it's not drawing like a, a true picture. Uh, the water surface is going over the sag in the roadway, but there's part of the road that is above the water surface elevation. So that's kind of a drawback of HY8. It doesn't really give you, uh, you know, your nice over the roadway diagram uh, because your, your road profile actually goes above the water surface elevation, you know, at both ends of the sag. The other thing I want to mention was um, there's no water surface on the front view. When you do the re recurrence interval uh, design, um, it does not give you a design uh, water surface elevation on the front view. Okay, if you've done the second example where it's the minimum and design and max, it does give you a water surface elevation uh, like a blue line on the front view. So that's a, a difference between those two methods. Certainly, um, it is nice to have that design uh, blue line in there. Okay, and the last thing I want to notice was the uh, was on the other the other project. On this one, when you look at the pr at the cross sections, whoops. Okay, when the tailwater elevation is below the um, culvert depth, it does not model what happens to the flow after it leaves the culvert. Okay, so you'll see this discontinuous jump here at the tailwater, at the outlet end of the culvert. There's a jump from the water surface down to the tailwater surface. Okay, HY8 does not model what happens to this flow. Obviously, it kind of tails down. Uh, as it dumps out of the culvert into the into this pool here, but uh, you know it's a discontinuous jump. It looks a little bit jarring if you're following the water flow through the culvert. Um, so just realize when you're doing an analysis that HY just does not do anything with this. Okay. Um, all right. So if you have any other questions or uh, want to report any bugs on the lessons, uh, definitely shoot me an email and uh, move on to the next section. Thanks. This lesson is going to cover some of the topics that we've kind of hinted at in the other exercises. Uh, we're going to go into them in a little more detail um, quickly before we wrap up. First thing I want to cover is cover over culverts. Uh, so in this culver culvert picture you see here, you can see that the roadway is right on top of the top of the culvert. Uh, this will actually work for, uh, for low traffic situations over a concrete pipe because uh, concrete can kind of support that load all by itself. For a plastic or metal pipe, this won't work 
at the top the plastic will start denting and cracking as uh, as animals or vehicles go over it. Uh, those types of flexible pipes really need soil cover over them to transmit load around the pipe and the and the soil on the sides of the pipe also help support the pipe. Uh, so for flexible pipes like plastic and metal, be sure to have that minimum one foot cover over the culvert top. The next thing is sometimes culvert is not your go-to choice for a stream crossing. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a project in the New York City watershed. They have this detail for an at-grade crossing using precast concrete hog slats. Uh, and that's pretty uh, uh, pretty nice. You know, you can see in this case, if you had too much water to go through a culvert, you know, it's not that big a deal. The water can just go up as high as it normally would. Uh, yet the crossing is still stabilized for animals and, and vehicles to get across it. Next, we didn't really cover outlet protection, uh, rock riprap pr 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 protection, but I think the New York, S New York State DEC Blue Book covers that uh, pretty well, and that's the reference that you should use to design rock riprap uh, outlet protection. Um, if you're not familiar with the Blue Book, I suggest you download it from New York State DEC's website. Its official title is the Standards and Specifications for Erosion and Sediment Control in New York State. Um, it used to be it used to have a blue cover and that's why people call it the blue book uh, there's lots of you know background detail on rock riprap outlet protection uh, for helping you with your designs and then finally I want to cover entrance loss coefficients for this type of situation uh, this outlet configuration is pretty popular in New York um, because the galvanized steel won't photodegrade like the plastic pipe will, so people put the galvanized end sections on the plastic pipes. I know DOT is really really big on this setup. Um, so there aren't um, entrance loss options for this type of setup in HY8, but in HDS5, remember the reference that HY8 uses, um, they've, uh, they've studied this situation and it's roughly comparable to a head wall with a square edge inlet. So if you're going to be designing a project with a flared inlet, uh, flared end section on your inlet, just use square edge uh, head wall. Don't try and make a comparable tapered inlet or a conforming to slope or, or something like that. Just use head wall with a square edge um, and make a note of that in your design somewhere that that's what that's what you did because um, this is comparable to to a square edge head wall. Uh, and there's here's HES5, uh, the table where it lists that. Okay, table C2 down at the bottom. It's a note about flared end sections. That wraps up this culvert design series. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you find any bugs or mistakes in it, please feel, feel free to let me know uh, at the email address below. And have fun designing culverts. <laughs>